So it's my honor to introduce Dr. Tyrone Hayes, who's a faculty member in the Department of Integrative Biology at the University of California, Berkeley, reading National Geographic and his love for frogs as a child inspired him to pursue a degree from Harvard University, which it appears that that was the only university he applied to during high school. Um, he graduated with summa cum, uh, summa cum laude recognition in 1989. He later graduated from the Department of Integrative Biology at UC Berkeley, where he studied the role of hormones on sex determination in amphibians. He likely became the youngest full-time professor in the year 2002 when he was 35. Since he started teaching, he directly trained now over 200 students in his lab and over 1,500 students in his various classes. So it's my honor to welcome Dr. Tyrone Hayes to the stage. Thank you very much. good to have a mic so people can hear me. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I want to thank you for having me come out to, to share with you uh, something I call From Silent Spring to Silent Night, A Tale of Toads and Men. Um, before I explain to you what I think is my creative title, I want to share with you a uh, phrase that I learned while working in Southern Africa. It's a, it's a proverb. And it basically translates to people are people through other people. And I think that's very fitting for here and what I'm feeling from people here. But I also like to introduce myself this way because I want to, before I tell you who I am, I want to tell you about the people who made me who I am. First and foremost, family. Um, it, this is an old family portrait. They don't allow me to be in them anymore because I do things like that. So we, we got to update, upgrade that. But first and foremost, my parents, I am a biologist, so as you all know, I would literally would not be here without them. So for their love and support throughout my 47 years to my parents, I also want to thank this beautiful woman, my wife. Um, in many ways, I also would not be here without her and without her love and support. And finally, or not finally, but my two ones, they wouldn't be here without my wife and me. And, and I'm very proud, I'm a, I'm a modern day father. I don't know which I'm more proud of, that these are both prom pictures. And I don't know which I'm more proud of, that my son borrowed my tie for his prom, or that my daughter borrowed my earrings for her prom. It's, they, were both, <laughs> they were both very, very, very proud father moments for me. I also want to acknowledge my funding sources. It costs money to do research. And this is also my disclosure. Um, I have been funded by the chemical industry, Novartis, Syngenta, EcoRisk. So I know firsthand the kind of things that they do, and I'll tell you about some of those. I also want to thank all of the students that have been involved. Everybody in blue is an undergraduate. So these are students that have been involved in my lab for the last 20 years or so, and, and this is a list of my current students. And finally, I want to dedicate this to my grandmother who passed away a few years ago in 2005. Um, before she herself passed away, she passed on her love of education and her desire to make the world a better th place through education onto me. She also taught me a very important lesson along with my father, that if you want people to, to get a point, just tell a good story. So I don't lecture, I don't give talks, I don't give speeches, I just wanna tell you my story and how I got invited here today. Um, there's some alternative points of view this is my good friend, I'm using the word sarcastically, Tim Pasteur of Syngenta. And, and here's something he said to me once. They try, to, they try to pull this trick a lot of times and convince me that because I view myself as an advocate and a scientist, that somehow I'm doing something wrong. He's, he's saying here, you know what you are. You're a preacher, that's what you are. You're not a scientist, you're a preacher. So they're always trying to lay this psychological stuff. I mean, but I'll tell you, he got one thing right. I am gonna preach tonight. So I'm going to speak from the heart. I'm also, though, going to teach tonight because the data is where I start. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the science that has driven my passion, that's led me to encourage defiance, 
and a move to action. I also agree with this guy who said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So not only can you be a scientist and an advocate, at least some people and some people that I respect feel like you have a duty to do both of those things, and I accept that challenge. My story starts really from when I was a child. As a child, I've, I've always been in love with biology. I've always been in love with frogs. And I've also, as long as I can remember, dreamed of going to Africa. And I wasn't thinking about pesticides or environmental health or public health or anything like that when I first went to Africa. I was really just thinking about frogs. And as a graduate student, I discovered this interesting little frog in the Arabuka Sokoke. It's a rainforest on the coast in Kenya where the males and females look completely different. I worked with these animals in the laboratory and showed that they all start out green. So this is the same frog photographed once a day for six days. But the females change color at sexual maturity. Now this was, this was really just a curiosity. But I formulated this hypothesis because the females change color at puberty. We hypothesized that it was probably hormone driven and that probably estrogens were involved. So in the same way that estrogens make women grow breast at puberty, we hypothesized that estrogen makes this frog change color when it reaches puberty. And so we tested that real simply just by applying hormones to the water, just literally dipping the frogs in hormones. And we were able to show that while testosterone, the male hormone had no effect, we could cause these animals to change color prematurely or even make males change color if we dipped them in estrogen. Real simple. Here's how I got involved in this pesticide and the so-called endocrine disruptor issue. We ended up patenting this frog and patenting for the following reason. We tested dozens of compounds. We showed, for example, that they all start out green, like the one you see here. So the control or untreated one's green. Then we showed that the natural estrogen will make them change color. Then we showed that ethanol estradiol, which is used in birth control pill, will make them change color. We showed that the pharmaceutical DES will make them change color. And we showed that DDT, which is not a hormone, but actually mimics estrogen will make them change color. So we screened dozens of compounds and we found out that every estrogen that made our frog change color was also known to promote breast cancer, which is estrogen dependent. So we patented this frog and the use of this frog because we could screen compounds or water. You could send me a sample of water and I could dip my frog in it. If it changed color, then we knew there was something bad in your water, literally. <laughs> we also showed, however, that we could block this color change with a chemical called tamoxifen. And tamoxifen is the estrogen blocker that you use to treat women with breast cancer. So we could also screen and potentially discover compounds that might be used to treat breast cancer as well as compounds that might promote breast cancer. That's how I got involved in all the chemical stuff. Just really sort of little boy curiosity based stuff. So we got some press when we filed the patent and then Novartis, they would later become Syngenta, but Novartis came to us and said, we're your first customer. We want you to screen this compound atrazine. Here it is, that's a so-called S-chlorotriazine. I, I don't know if you're into chemistry or not, I'm not. It's an herbicide or a weed killer. It's been used since 1958, and we use 80 million pounds in the United States per year. Uh, it's used in more than 80 countries, so it's a global concern and it's now outlawed in all of Europe. And now actually, I keep this slide up because it really pisses their lawyers off. They, they keep writing me letters saying, it has been denied regulatory approval. It has not been banned. I don't know what the difference is. <laughs> but as you know, this one pisses them off, so this is the one that I leave. As you know, the company's based in Europe. So we're using 80 million pounds of a chemical that's not allowed on the continent that the company calls home. So, what we were asked to do is actually to use another African frog, the African clawed frog, and we were asked to just expose these frogs to atrazine developmentally and just see if anything happens. There really was no hypothesis other than something might happen. And when we did that, while I was working with, for the company, I was a professor at the university but being paid by the company, we showed that atrazine inhibited growth of the voice box or the larynx in males. Now, this upset the company a little bit because the same reason that men have deeper voices than women Male frogs sing and females don't. So the implication was that testosterone levels, the male hormone, was not being made properly in these animals. What's more is when we looked at the gonads, there's going to be a lot of gonads in my talk tonight, we showed the following. So these are kidneys, and this is an animal. 
that, God, I must have shown this slide a thousand times now, but this is an animal that has a mixture of testes and ovaries, which is not normal. <laughs> and that's not any kind of judgment call on my part. Lots of people have seen Jurassic Park and asked me, aren't frogs naturally hermaphroditic? That's science fiction. Typically in frogs, males are males and females are females. There are fish that are naturally hermaphroditic, but there are no frogs, there are no amphibians that are naturally hermaphroditic. So we formulated a hypothesis then that went the following. So normally the testis should make testosterone. The word testosterone literally means testicular hormone. That's where the word comes from, it's the male hormone. And so we hypothesized that atrazine turns on aromatase. I want you to remember the word aromatase. Aromatase is the enzyme, or it's the machinery, that converts testosterone into estrogen. This is the female hormone. It literally means the generator of estrus. And so the idea is that, one, you're demasculinized, or chemically castrated, because you're using up your testosterone, so that's why your voice box doesn't grow, but you're subsequently feminized because now you're making estrogen which is maybe fine if you're a female, maybe not so much if you're a male. And we showed, before we published this, we showed that in fact, if you look at control males, so unexposed compared to atrazine treated males, compared to control females, that if you're exposed to atrazine and you're a male, your testosterone levels are no different from a female. And we went on to, to publish that in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, peer reviewed journal, one of the top journals in the world really for science. And of course that didn't, that didn't make the company too happy. Uh, it left a few questions hanging, as important as I thought the paper was. One, we didn't know if these hermaphrodites were males with ovaries or females with testis. And two, we didn't know what happens when they become adults. So you have to grow these animals up for four or five years to really see if these hermaphrodites, for example, would remain hermaphrodites or become females or males. Uh, more recently, we published the answer to that question. And, and, and really, this says it all. See that guy who looks like he's smiling? He's a male, so now we have genes, and so we do some fancy biology too. Females have a gene that males don't express, that males don't have. And so we can determine now that in fact this guy is a male, and, and that's his brother. So it turns out in this population about 10% of all the males completely turn into females. They lay eggs just like a female, they breed like a female. If we didn't have the molecular biology and could measure the genes, we wouldn't know that this was genetically a male. In fact, this one, I always tell the story, he is a grandmother now. It's not something you hear every day. <laughs> um, what's more is those we showed when the males, the ones who don't turn into females grow up, there are other problems. So for example, if you look at their mating behavior, and this is a uh, test where they compete for females in a pool, the atrazine treated males almost never get the female. And what's more is we showed the reasons they don't get the female, as you might guess, are because they don't have enough testosterone. So for example, if you look at the average testosterone levels in males competing for females, the controls are much higher on average, but more importantly, the animals that are successful, shown here in the little hearts, the ones that actually get the females actually have much higher testosterone levels. Now, we don't know the answer. We don't know whether the females just don't like these atrazine treated males or if they get beat up by these males, but the point is they don't make enough testosterone to show male breeding behavior. Not so good if you're company's number one selling product is doing these kinds of things. The next series of studies we did is we didn't allow them to compete, we just paired up males and atrazine treated males with females and we looked at their fertility. So this is the equivalent of kind of doing a sperm count, if you will. So we allowed them to mate overnight and then we just counted how many eggs hatched in the next couple of days. So it's a measure of the male's fertility. And if you do that, so this is an unfertilized egg, these are all fertilized eggs, real tough work in my lab. Right? There's a student sitting there going, one, two, three. <laughs> These guys lay about 2,000 eggs. And, and when you do that, you find out the controls fertilize about 85%. Whereas the atrazine treated males have a fertility rate of about 15%. For two reasons, it turns out. One is they don't even try. Even if there's no competition, they sit there and they watch the females lay eggs. They don't even try to make a move. And two, even if they do, their testis look like this. So this is a control, and I'll blow that up. So that's all sperm inside the testicular tubule, whereas if you look at the atrazine treated animal, the testicular tubules are effectively empty with cellular debris and no sperm. So they don't have enough testosterone to show the behavior, and even if they showed the behavior, 
they don't have enough testosterone to maintain sperm, so they have a very low fertility. So we published a second paper, Atrazine induces complete feminization and chemical castration in male African clawed frogs. The company really hates the word chemical castration. So I made sure to put it in a title. Well, that's just the kind of brother I am. <laughs> so the next thing we did is we went on to ask, is this just something weird that happens in this one species of frog, or can we find this effect in other places? We looked at the North American leopard frog, and this was a paper that was eventually published in Nature, another top journal. And here are testis, and all this, I usually call it junk in the trunk. These are all eggs that are bursting through the surface of this male's testis. Now, you already heard some mention of the EPA. I got involved with the EPA that, regardless of what you might read on Syngenta's paid websites, the EPA was in my laboratory watching me process data, and the EPA had access. They even wrote me an email thanking me for allowing, me, allowing them in my lab and supplying them with raw unpublished data. So the EPA saw and in fact reanalyzed all of my data. But I remember, I still remember Tom Steger from the EPA. I sent this photograph and I, I said, this is about to be published in Nature. I mean, I broke protocol. You're not supposed to send out raw data. And I still remember, he wrote me back and he said, thank you, Dr. Hayes. This is a very interesting finding. However, we do not feel it is one that would initiate reassessment and regulation of atrazine. It's not an adverse effect, they said. Now, I, I'm going to talk to the guys for a minute. So my wife tells me there is nothing more painful in life than childbirth. I'm going to give her that. She's probably right. But guys, I would guess that a dozen chicken eggs in my testicle would be in the top five, at least. <laughs> Right? The EPA says, no, nope, this is not an adverse effect. Keep on spraying. That was my interaction with them. The other reason we worked with the North American leopard frog is we wanted to look in the wild and ask, is this a phenomenon that you just see in the laboratory? Is it a laboratory artifact? Or is this something we have to worry about in the real world? Now, to give you an idea of how much atrazine we're talking about, in our experiments, we use 0.1 parts per billion. That's 0.1 micrograms per liter or 100 nanograms per liter or 100 picograms per mil. Like to give you a better idea, that's about one one thousandth of a grain of salt in two liters produces this effect. Now, the package of atrazine recommends application at 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. So a farmer could be using this stuff at levels that are 290 million times higher than we're using in the laboratory. If you look at agriculture runoff, these are minimum and maximum detectable levels from published papers, temporary pools, permanent water, precipitation. Here's what we're using in the laboratory. So all of these environments, all of these habitats would be at risk based on our laboratory findings. There's enough atrazine in rainwater to chemically castrate and feminize frogs. Turns out a half million pounds of atrazine come down into rainwater every year. It goes up on dust, it can travel a thousand miles, and then comes down. It turns out that the EPA recommends three parts per billion, 30 times higher than we know to be biologically effective in your drinking water. That's the U.S.'s standard, and that's the standard that other governments, that other agencies from around the world say, well, the U.S. allows it, it must be safe. We went out into the field, and we collected animals from the field, and I'm going to show you now what this test is, looks like under the microscope. So I'm folding out a slice, I'm going to blow that up, and if I blow this up, these are testicular tubules, except remember they're supposed to have sperm in them, except these have eggs. We published a paper in Nature, I, I termed these testicular oocytes. Pissed the company off, they don't like me to make up words. They said that's not a word, I said it is a word. I published it, so it's a word. <laughs> testicular oocytes, I don't know why it upsets them so much. It turns out, here's a map of mainland US, you can see in the red where most of the atrazine is used. We, we did a study where we did a transect, and I, I usually say something obnoxious like we control for latitude, but the reality is this is Highway I-80, and we were going to a meeting in Indiana, and, and we drove to the meeting and collected frogs and got a nature paper. See, that's fuel efficiency right there. It turns out that when you do that, every place we found atrazine, we found hermaphrodites and vice versa. But the reason this was published in such a top journal was not because of just a correlational analysis, because we also had laboratory data. So we could take animals from a clean site and raise them in atrazine, 
and they would come out as hermaphrodites, or we could take animals from a contaminated site and raise them in clean water, and they would come out normal. So we could show that it wasn't just a variation, natural variation or a coincidence, that there was a cause and effect factor involved. Well, one of the other things we wanted to do, and then I'll tell you while we're talking about frogs in Hawaii when you don't have any native frogs anyway, one of the other things we wanted to do is we wanted to look on a landscape like this one in Nebraska. Most of the Midwestern U.S. looks like this. And we wanted to ask some questions about how important was atrazine, how important were pesticides in general relative to other stressors that might be driving amphibians extinct. So for example, here's a cornfield in Nebraska. They're actually, you have to trust me, they're leopard frog tadpoles developing in this runoff. And it's not just atrazine, but all these herbicides, all these insect, uh, fungicides and all these insecticides are all applied just to that one field, just to that one. The next field is applying a different combination, the next field is a different one. The only thing they all have in common is that they all either use atrazine or glyphosate. It's always in the mixture. But by the time the runoff gets to here, it's probably, I don't know, you heard Dr. Pang speak, who knows what the combination is, but at least what was applied to this field, we tested those chemicals individually or in combination. And what you find out, I won't bore you with all the data, but what you find out when you test those mixtures is that you cannot predict the effect of the mixture by looking at the individual compounds or by testing the individual compounds and adding them all up together, the effects that is. It turns out that stress hormones, which can cause immune suppression, retarded growth and development, are stimulated by pesticides. And the more pesticides you give, doesn't, almost doesn't matter which ones they are, the bigger the stress hormone that's released and the greater these kinds of effects you see. So the pesticides themselves can be toxic, but they can also wreak havoc on the endocrine system and then cause indirectly down the road some problem like increased parasite loads because the immune system's been knocked down. Then we wanted to do a study where we wanted to ask, what is the impact of pesticide mixtures, again, relative to other stressors? So we worked in the Salinas, on the Salinas River. At, Who's, who's ever eaten something from Salinas? Yeah, probably everybody should raise your hand. So 85% of the country's lettuce comes from Salinas. I mean, it's huge. And this is only like, it's only like a two hour drive, right? The river flows south and north, and most of the farms are in the north part of the river. So we can do an experiment, well, experiment's already been done, where we can go to the mouth, this is Santa Margarita, this is where rich people down here get their water from, it's a protected watershed, no pesticides, 22 degrees water, foot and a half deep. Further down, through most of the river, there's no water because it's all being drained for agriculture. The water table's so low. So you get situations like this where these tadpoles aren't exposed to pesticides yet, but they're in about an inch of water at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and there's about 3,000 tadpoles. So they're stressed, but not exposed to pesticides. And then further down on Salinas, the water's back, but 100% of that water is agricultural runoff. So we just, we literally went down the river um, and here's what that looks like on Google Earth. We went down the river at each side and asked, what's it like to be a tadpole before you have any stress, after all the water's gone, and when the water's back, but now filled with pesticides and fertilizers? And again, I won't bore you with all the data. A picture's worth a thousand words. Here's what it looks like. The only difference between this tadpole and this tadpole is that this tadpole, this tadpole is living downstream of water that runs off of our food. They're the same age, the same species, the same developmental stage, collected about two hours apart on the same day. And this one has no, almost no immune function when it lives downstream of that agriculture. Something as simple as a yeast injection will kill tadpoles living downstream of agriculture. So here we are, that's where we did our collection. You can see that all of, all of that surrounding agriculture that's impacting that river. And something struck me, and actually somebody pointed out to me in the audience once, that East of Eden, written by John Steinbeck, he actually made a statement about Salinas where we're collecting these frogs. John Steinbeck wrote in 1952, Salinas was, was surrounded and penetrated with swamps with tool-filled ponds, and every pond spawned thousands of frogs. With the evening, the air was so full of their song that it was a kind of roaring silence. It was a veil, a background, and a sudden disappearance, as after a clap of thunder was a shocking thing. It is possible if in the night the frog song should have stopped, everyone in Salinas would have awakened, feeling that there was a great noise. In their millions, the frog songs seem to have a beat and a cadence, and perhaps it is the ears function to do this just 
as it is the eye's business to make stars twinkle. What I'm going to share with you now is a recording of what Selena sounds like now, today. There's no sound. I haven't heard a single native frog call on Salinas in the five years that we've been working there. I was just there the other night. And what I think is beautiful about that piece is it wasn't a scientist, it wasn't a, da a data set, but a literary artist wrote about the frogs. The frogs was such an important part of that landscape that a literary artist wrote about it, and now it's gone. Silent night. I published a paper with my graduate students, and I'm not going to try to tell you that frogs are disappearing because of pesticides, but pesticides are an important ultimate factor. The number one factor is habitat loss. But when you drain all the water away and the only water that's available is agricultural runoff, now pesticides become very important. When pesticides cause a stress response, and when you couple that with climate change and the habitat loss and invasive species, that's not a native species we're looking at, and your immune system's non-functioning, then disease becomes very important. And so a scientist walks in and says, oh, it reminds me of the bee story. Oh, the frogs are dying of disease. Well, they're dying of disease because they're living in marginalized habitat, competing with invasive species, immune systems knocked out because of the pesticides. And so, yeah, of course, they're dying of disease. But the disease, I don't believe, is the real problem. This is a slide from Lake Nabugabu, and I, and I love this in Uganda. I love this because it demonstrates what I used to think was the connection between environmental health and public health. You see, the runoff from this crop, which goes into these containers, is the sole source of drinking and cooking water for this village. I used to think this showed the connection between environmental health and public health. I don't think so anymore. This shows us that there is no distinction between environmental health and public health. And if I told the people in Uganda what was going on with frogs in that water running off of their crop, the connection between that and what we've done to the water would be very clear, whereas in my, here's my village, I just live somewhere there, my water just comes from there, though. And we make assumptions, many of us, that the EPA or some magical, some agency somewhere wouldn't allow anything bad in our water. I may be preaching to the choir, but I think you know that's not the case. I call this From Silent Spring to Silent Night as a play on Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, in much the same way that, I, that Rachel Carson taught that the death of birds and the role that pesticides were playing and our pending Silent Spring was a warning to us in much the same way, I believe that our new canary in the coal mine, our amphibians, are a warning to us, and our pending silent night, our silent night that's already here in many places. 70% of all amphibians, a group of animals that have been around since the dinosaurs, a group of animals that survived the mass extinction that took away the dinosaurs, are disappearing rapidly from the planet now. And I believe pesticides play a critical role. So why do we care about you might want to get rid of the non-native frogs that are here in Hawaii because there are no native ones. But, so why should you care? That's for the following. I work on amphibians. My colleague, though, says in echoepidemiology, the occurrence of an association in more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. Well, I've shown you more than correlation. I've shown you controlled experiments on more than one population, more than one species, more than one genera, more than one family of frogs. What's more, however, People have shown similar effects in fish, reptiles and birds, and mammals, including health effects of atrazine on humans that are very similar to what we see in our frogs. So there's nonsense that Syngenta likes to publish that nobody's replicated my work. One, it's not true. Many people have shown effects of amphibians, but effects have been shown across vertebrate classes, not by me, but by scientists from all around the world. I wrote to those scientists, most of whom I didn't know, and said, hey, let's publish a paper together. We all put our data together. This paper was recently published, Demasculization and Feminization of Male Gonads by Atrazine, Consistent Effects Across Vertebrate Classes. And this paper, I invented the word gonadotoxin. I, that pissed them off too. <laughs> but you know, that's just the kind of brother I am. It turns out, and I didn't know any of these people, it turns out, here's, here's my frog test. It's right, full of sperm, give him atrazine, no sperm. I had already published this. Turns out a guy in Belgium, Publish this. Here's fish. Sperm in the testes, give it atrazine, no sperm. Turns out here's a guy in Argentina. I didn't know this guy, I know him now. Sperm in the testes, this is a reptile, it's a caiman, it's like a big alligator. Give it atrazine, no sperm. This work was done in Croatia, I didn't even know the guy, I know him now. And also in uh, Nigeria, that's a rat testis full of sperm. 
give rats atrazine and there's no sperm, and this is a guy in Pakistan in birds. Sperm in the testis, give him atrazine, no sperm. So look at this coincidence. Every vertebrate class that's been examined, we published that paper, there were 22 of us from 12 different countries around the world have done experiments in different ways and come up with the same result. Syngenta says it's not real. The other thing we've been able to show is that if you give frogs atrazine, I told you testosterone goes down, that's why they don't have enough sperm. Let's say I messed up, I did something wrong in the lab. Here's a guy in England, peer-reviewed and published, same thing in salmon. Give him testosterone, or atrazine, there's no testosterone. That's my work in frogs, and that's rats. So again, we're seeing this effect by independent scientists from around the world. This stuff is all peer-reviewed and published. In humans now, we can't do experiments, or at least we're not supposed to, but my colleague Shauna Swan has showed that men who have atrazine in their urine, have, and this work was done in Columbia, Missouri, have low sperm count and can't get their wives pregnant. Now, I, again, it's just correlation, right? But imagine that. Men who have 0.1 parts per billion atrazine in their urine, enough atrazine to chemically castrate a frog, have low sperm count and can't get their wives pregnant. It's just a correlation, but we've shown this experimentally in fish, in amphibians, in reptiles, in birds, and in rats. Now let me show you this. I'm going to squash this down, because here's the levels of atrazine in men who work in the fields in California. It's published, and now I'm going to squash it down, because here's the levels of atrazine in men who apply atrazine in California in their urine. These men have 2,400 parts per billion atrazine in their urine. These men have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine than we use to chemically castrate frogs and fish in the lab. These men have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine than we know is associated with low sperm count and infertility in men in Columbia, Missouri. One of these guys could pee in a bucket. I could dilute the atrazine in their urine 24,000 times, and I could use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. I think of myself as just a little boy who likes frogs, but now I'm using words like environmental racism and environmental justice. Because these men, 90% are Hispanic, Mexican, Mexican-Americans. Not only do we know nothing about their reproductive health, but many of them have life expectancies of 50. What's more is, if we look at California, and I'm often giving this talk outside of California, and so people are surprised. California is fifth, somebody said seventh last time I gave this, somewhere between fifth and seventh richest country in the world. If California were its own country, we'd be the fifth richest country in the world because of agriculture. One in 10 jobs in agriculture, 30% of the lands in agriculture. We produce 350 agricultural products. And here's the thing that blew me away. I didn't know this. 50% of the U.S.'s food, 50% of the fruits, nuts, vegetables, and dairy for the entire country, half of the food comes from California. What's more is we use more pesticides than any other state, and 90% of the workers are Hispanic. And red now are the top 10 counties for agriculture in California, about 30%. So these are the counties that make us the fifth largest economy in the world. These are the counties that make us the fifth richest country in the world. Where do you think the 30 poorest towns in California are? So the people who make us the fifth richest country in the world are the targets of chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. Something just doesn't seem right about that to me. Now, does atrazine turn on aromatase? Is this something that we only have to worry about for frogs and egg production? No. Aromatase and estrogen are very important in both prostate cancer and breast cancer, the number two cancers, depending on who you talk to, after lung cancer. With regards to prostate cancer, in their own factory, they show that there's an 8.4-fold increase in the men who work in their factory bagging atrazine compared to men who work in the factory but don't work in the room with the atrazine dust. And it's a community that's 80% black, 80% African American. San Gabriel, Louisiana. I'll tell you why I bring that up in a minute. With regards to breast cancer, there's at least one study showing a very strong correlation. Women whose well water is contaminated with atrazine are more likely to get breast cancer compared to women who live in the same community but don't drink their well water. This is peer reviewed and published. What's more is that's just correlation. But guess what? If you give rats atrazine, their testosterone goes down and their estrogen goes up. But what's more is, and the company published this, not me, is that if those same rats have an increase in estrogen-dependent breast cancers, mammary tumors. 
So it's just a correlation in humans, but they already knew, they had already done the experiments to show that atrazine will promote breast cancer in rats. They already knew it, it was already published. In humans, and one of their scientists also published this, we've published two papers, but I'm gonna show you their work. If you take a human cell line from the adrenal gland that doesn't make aromatase or estrogen, if you give it atrazine, guess what? It expresses aromatase and starts making estrogen, just like we've shown in fish, just like we've shown in frogs, just like we've shown in reptiles, birds, and rats, but these are human cell lines. Now, we're no different than the animals that we study in the laboratory in this regard. I went to visit them. They became Syngenta, which I think should be spelled with an I, but that's just me. <laughs> they have a pipe that runs directly into the Mississippi River. Collectively, of all the runoff from Missouri River and the Mississippi and the North Platte, 1.2 million pounds of atrazine blows into the Gulf of Mexico every year. As far as I know, nobody's studying what that impact is. And that's along with the other chemicals. Much of the community looks like this, and it's an area in San Gabriel, Louisiana, that's 80% African American. And here's why I bring that up. These are the top 13 cancers that you're going to get in the US. In red now, 11 of the 13 are the ones that you're more likely to get if you're black, if you're African American. This is the mortality rate relative to white or Caucasian Americans. If you're black, if you're African American, you're more likely to die from 13 out of 13 cancers, top 13. And here's where I'm at now. I'm a little boy who likes frogs. But here's where I'm at. I'm like, is this biology? Or is this environment? When they tell you that you're more likely to get breast cancer if your sister, your aunt, or your mother, or somebody in your family had breast cancer, is that genetics? Or does that mean, no, you've just been exposed to the same crap? that your sister, your aunt, your mother have been exposed to. If you're a minority, you're more likely to live in and more likely to work in an area where you're gonna expose the chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. I'm all about cures. Coleman for the Cure invited me to give a keynote. First thing I asked him, I said, you don't give me no money, why you wanna hear what I gotta say? I titled my talk, An Ounce of Prevention. I'm all about cures, but how about we focus on the causes? There's no money in the cause, that's why. You don't get to put your name on a cause. What's more is, of all these cancers up here, the cell lines that they use in labs to study these cancers, none of them come from minorities, from black or Hispanic men and women. So the very cures that we're looking for may be irrelevant to the people who are more likely to get and more likely to die from these very same diseases. A student of mine showed that if you take a human breast cancer cell and give it atrazine, it starts expressing aromatase and making estrogen just like we've shown in fish just like we've shown in frogs, just like we've shown in reptiles, birds, rats, and other cell lines. But what this means is that if you get a breast cancer, well, first off, think about this. Most women get breast cancer after menopause. Most women get an estrogen-dependent cancer when the estrogen levels in their blood are lower than they've ever been in your life. You know why that is? Because breast cancer is highly correlated with your lifetime exposure to estrogen or estrogen-like chemicals but also because these damaged cells, I asked you to remember aromatase, they make their own estrogen locally. So even though your levels in your blood are low, when you get breast cancer, you have cells called fibroblasts that are making estrogen to feed those damaged cells and cause them to turn into tumors. It turns out that this local expression of aromatase is so important that the number one treatment for breast cancer is a chemical called letrozole. It's a drug that knocks out aromatase and decreases estrogen. So even if you get a cancer, a damaged cell, it doesn't turn into a tumor. Does anybody else see what I see? How much sense does that make when the number one contaminant in our drinking water does exactly the opposite? It turns on aromatase, it increases estrogen, it's associated with breast cancer, and promotes breast cancer in rats. Turns out Novartis Oncology offers treatments for cancers that range from breast cancer. So it turns out that until 2000, and I'm saying that correct because I know Syngenta has their note taker here, somebody tipped me off. Until 2000, the same company that gave us 80 million pounds of an aromatase inducer was also selling us an aromatase blocker. Until 2000, Novartis was selling letrozole to block aromatase and treat breast cancer and selling atrazine. And in 2000, when they discovered that atrazine turns on aromatase, they spun off Syngenta and split up the company. Well, what a little interesting coincidence that is. I published a paper called The One-Stop Shop, Chemical Causes and Cures with Breast Cancer. <laughs> Pissed them off. But, you know, that's just the kind of brother I am. So I think what's happened is 
I think I'm going to convince you that my interest in this aquatic organism has told me a great deal about this aquatic organism. I would argue that, first off, if there's no argument, we're using the same hormones for development as humans. We're developing in water, in the amniotic fluid. And I would argue that my tadpoles trapped in a contaminated aquarium or a contaminated pond are no different than a fetus trapped in a contaminated womb. Studies now show that we are exposed to over 300 chemicals before we leave the womb, most of which we have no idea what they do. In the case of atrazine, we have rat studies to show us that at least one chemical atrazine causes prostate and mammary cancer in rats. But what's more important are the developmental effects. It causes immune failure, which we've also shown in frogs. It causes neural damage when pregnant rats, mothers, are exposed to atrazine. It causes abortion, and an EPA laboratory showed this. Pregnant rats fed atrazine have abortions because of the hormone balance it creates. A second EPA laboratory published and showed that of those rats that don't abort, the sons are born with prostate disease. Another laboratory, EPA laboratory, showed that of those rats that don't abort, the daughters are born with poor mammary development. And then when they grow up, they published another paper showing that the grandchildren suffer from retarded growth and development. Now, out of all the papers that I've published, that I feel very proud of. All the papers I've published on atrazine, no work has impacted me as much as this work, which isn't mine. Because this rat, and we study rats because they're mammals like us. This rat is affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. This rat never saw atrazine. This rat was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. That rat never saw atrazine. That rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So when I think about my little girl, she's 18 now, when I think about what it means to be a scientist, when I think about what it means to be an advocate, when I think about what it means to be both, I think about my little girl and my son. And the fact that those data tell me that my grandchildren could be affected by chemicals that we're applying today. We don't have to wait for the data. This is a colleague, Paul Winchester, has shown that if you get pregnant when atrazine levels peak, you're more likely to have birth defects. That's just correlation, but we can produce these things in laboratory animal models. It's just correlation, but another study just came out showing that maternal exposure to surface water atrazine is associated with fetal gastrothesis. Now, I can't pronounce it. And I saw there's some kids in the audience. You might want to cover your eyes. I can't pronounce it, but I can show you what it is. A former student of mine, a medical student, is now studying this issue. Here's another paper that just came out showing that atrazine is associated with coanal atresia. And here's another paper that I think is probably the most important. I won't read it to you. But this is a paper that shows that if you're having a male child, if you're having a son, and you're exposed to atrazine, you're more likely to develop three genital abnormalities. You're more likely, and this isn't my work, this is the work of others, you're more likely to have a son, if you're exposed to atrazine, you're more likely to have a son with hypospadias. That's where the urethra doesn't come all the way through the end of the penis. If you're exposed to atrazine when you're having a son, you're more likely to have cryptorchidism. This is when the baby's testicles don't descend into the scrotum. If you get pregnant, with the sun, and you're exposed to atrazine, you're more likely to have microphallus, where the penis doesn't grow. And what's interesting here is that the male genitalia, all of these features, the male genitalia requires testosterone in utero. And we know that atrazine knocks out testosterone in fish, in amphibians, in birds, in rats. And now if you're exposed to atrazine when you're pregnant with a male child, you're more likely to have abnormalities that associate it with low testosterone. So while we tend to talk about the effect of atrazine on adult men, I think we need to think more importantly about the more times when atrazine and other chemicals can have a much more critical effect. The fact that the poisons that go into our bodies when we're pregnant are affecting the developing fetus. I've already told you over 300 synthetic chemicals are in the womb in most of us now. Even after that, the poisons that go into our body end up in the breast milk. And even after that, there's direct exposure. 
And a little bit of poison for an adult is a huge amount and can have a much bigger impact on a young developing child. What's curious is the EPA said, this is from this New Yorker article that was just published, that a monetary value is assigned to disease, impairments, and shortened lives and weighed against the benefits of keeping a chemical in use. Think about what that says. The EPA is not saying that the chemicals out there don't have any impact. The EPA is saying we know that they have these health effects, but we're weighing them. There's a monetary value. And what concerns me is, if anybody thinks that that's an acceptable policy, supposedly we're all created equal. But you know, and here's why you act lo locally, but you have to have a global impact. We know that the price tag on this woman's head is very different from the price tag on others. Even if we were created equal, we know that some mothers are more likely to pass on just because where they, where they live toxins to their babies. We know that because of where we live and because of where we work, some people are more likely to have their little ones exposed than others. We don't all have the same price tag on our head for the EPA to weigh out. As a result of all these things, not just because what atrazine does to frogs, I have, somebody told me I have to walk across the screen when I show this, I crossed the line. I was told as a graduate student, don't be an advocate, let the science speak for itself. You hear a lot of that in academia. But when I thought about what I knew, and when I saw what was going on around me, I asked, how could I not be? People used to ask me, should I ban atrazine? I would, say, I would say, no, I'm a scientist. I'm only here to give you the facts. But how can I not give an opinion? How can I not be an advocate when I know I don't want my kids exposed? So how can I not share that with everyone else? This guy said, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. And again, I accept this as my philosophy now, not the let the science speak for itself. I accept this as my philosophy because the EPA said about my work in 2006, the ultimate decision is much bigger than science. It weighs in public opinion. So if I'm publishing my work in fancy journals that the public doesn't have access to, how can the public do its job? Because the EPA says they're counting on you. If you don't have the information, if I'm letting the science speak for itself, then how can you help the EPA do its job? How can you help the EPA do its job when people like Claus Werner were on the EPA panel to evaluate atrazine and being paid by the company that makes atrazine? This guy presented back to the same EPA review panel that he was on. And it was known, it was a fact, it wasn't a secret. Obama, points Monsanto VP, is advisor to the EPA. I love Obama. I voted for him twice, not in the same election. But when he comes back home, can somebody please ask him, what was he thinking? I crossed the line because, and you've already seen this slide, so I won't spend much time on it. My issue with GMOs is that they're being created by pesticide companies. And you've already heard the story. There's an inherent conflict of interest. The promise of GMO was that we were going to move away from pesticides, BT corn and all this mess, but we're doing just the opposite because the red circles sell chemicals. I crossed the line because Syngenta says they assume no obligation to update forward-looking statements to reflect the actual results. I don't even know what that means. I don't know who would say crap like that. <laughs> I crossed the line and it cost me, but ultimately I got paid back. Syngenta lost $105 million lawsuit from water districts to get atrazine out of people's water. But what was important for me was that in losing that lawsuit and settling that lawsuit, all of their notes from, pardon me, I'm gonna cuss, from all the shit that I knew they were doing anyway, all of their personal notes got published. Look what their plan was for the science. Number one, discredit Hayes. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's the thing. It didn't say redo Hayes' experiments. It didn't say re it said discredit Hayes. But here's the thing I'm thinking too. Who writes shit like that down? <laughs> who, who, I, I can see you say it. Oh, we got to discredit Hayes. But who writes it down and then turns it into a judge? <laughs> I don't know. Here's a couple of articles. How Syngenta investigated the press. They were invest Syngenta's paid 30 party pundits spin the news. This guy Enton who comes here to talk to California, I've seen the receipts that they pay this guy. Those words are put right into his mouth. John Enton, you guys know who I'm talking about. But here's some of the other things. 
They said they were going to do to me, more risky, have his work audited, FOIA raw data, investigate students. They crossed that out. I don't know if that meant they did it or not. Investigate funding, family background, school history, multiple emails, legal, court interactions. What's some of this other stuff they want to do? Consider suing for libel. These guys would investigate my wife. These guys were sitting around having focus groups on how to piss off a black guy. Here's some of the other stuff they wanted to do. I'm not making this up. Blog psychology, psychological profile. These guys paid somebody $10,000 to figure out if I was crazy or not. First off, you ain't got to pay nobody to find out if Tyrone crazy. You can ask anybody who know me, and they'll just tell you for free. The other things I can't figure out, the other things I can't figure out is what do you expect the gain from that, right? Because there's only two outcomes. He'll come back and say, no, he's not crazy. You just pissed off a black guy. Because some people get those two things confused. <laughs> the other possibility is they say, oh, yeah, he's crazy, and he's whipping your butt. These guys spent millions of dollars trying to prove my science wrong. And when they couldn't do it, they went after me. They went after my family. They threatened me when they couldn't do it. Don't disrespect him, they said. Here's some of the other things I wanted you. TH, paranoid, schizophrenic, and narcissistic. That's what the psychologist told him. But, but I brought this up because I wanted to, it says that I want to, I want to make modern industry ag. I want to, what is that? I want, oh, I want to undo modern industry. Syngenta is my nexus. Don't disrespect him, it says. They took all these notes on where I went and what I did. They tried to look for some support that I didn't have. I wish I did have some money. Tom Steger, the EPA, said about Syngenta, and I'm going to show you an example. It is unfortunate, but not uncommon, for registrants to sit on data that may be considered adverse to the public's perception of their products. Science can be manipulated to serve certain agendas. All you can do is practice suspended disbelief. That's what the EPA said about Syngenta. Here's a little piece I found while looking through their documents. It says, TBA may be a bit more potent than atrazine. Lower doses cause same effects. So they're admitting that atrazine does something. And then I want to read to you from one of their other pages. It causes an increase in mammary tumors, an increase in testicular tumors at doses above maximum tolerated, and decreases in body weight gain and decreases in survival. The reason I'm reading this, do you know what TBA is? Terbutalazine. That's the chemical that they replaced atrazine with in Europe. This was written before they replaced it, so the company knew. The company wrote down what the stuff did, and this is what they replaced atrazine with. And they say very clearly here, maybe a bit more potent than atrazine, lower doses cause same effects. So they know. And they're dumb enough to write it down and let it get captured. The things that we can do, as you're doing here, I've helped Keith Ellison write a bill to ban atrazine, to ban all triazines, because otherwise I don't think we can count on the EPA when this is their approach. I think, and I'm going to sum up in my last slide with words from somebody that I respect quite a bit. I think what we can do is exactly what you're doing here. It's time for us as a people to start making some changes. Let's change the way we eat. Let's change the way we live. Let's change the way we treat each other. You see, the old way wasn't working, so it's up to us to do what we got to do to survive. This guy said that.